So we're picking up Hamlet, Act One, Scene Five, right after Hamlet's little speech, his soliloquy about erasing everything from his brain, you know, except for the kill Claudius part. Okay, Horatio and Marcellus come in, and Hamlet says he won't reveal to them what he and the ghost spoke about, but he does say there's an errant knave in Denmark. Um, and he gets them to swear that they won't reveal anything they have seen that evening. So they won't talk about it to anybody else, they, et cetera, all right? And they swear multiple times. The ghost from underneath the stage commands them to swear they do. And they swear on Hamlet's sword one, because it's a sword, it's a symbol of royal authority, all that kind of stuff. Also because it's cross-shaped, right? Sword has the handle, you've got the blade guard here, and then the point. So, Hamlet then tells them, uh, bottom of page 1216, the 11th edition, in response to Horatio saying, O day and night, but this is wondrous strange. And what he means is, everything that we've seen, totally bizarre, Hamlet. And therefore, as a stranger give it welcome, there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. He says, as a stranger, give it welcome. And what he's talking about here is the idea of hospitality. In Greek, the word xenia, which is pronounced with an X like a x, xenia, uh, means stranger, foreigner, alien. It's where we get modern English, word that we hear too much of. Xenophobia, fear of strangers. It's also where you get the word xenophilia, love of strangers. And the only reason I'm mentioning this is this idea of giving hospitality to strangers goes back thousands of years, probably to at least five or 6,000 BC. Um, among the peoples that would give rise to all the people today that speak, all the national language groups that speak the languages of modern day, Russia, Germany, France, Italy, um, almost all of Europe, modern day India, etc. what are called the Indo-European languages. They had this notion that They have this idea that you are obliged, you are obligated, if somebody comes and knocks on your door in the middle of the night, you are obliged to welcome them into your home, give them food, shelter, rest, and send them merrily on their way when they are ready. Even if that person was an enemy, you were obliged to do that. To do that. And the reason was because it was thought, at times, those are gods. At times, the gods come and visit humans in the guise of strangers, wanderers. We see this especially borne out in the ancient Greek epic, the Odyssey, okay, where gods do appear as poor beggars at times. We also see it, St. Paul mentions it in the New Testament, that sometimes people have entertained angels unawares. So not gods, but angels. Okay, so. As a stranger, give it welcome. That is, embrace the strangeness, Horatio. Embrace the odyssey, uh, excuse me, the oddity. It's kind of like he's saying, you know, strap, strap in your seat because we're in for a ride. You're going to see a lot more strange stuff. There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. It's that line that... causes many readers, critics, to suggest that Horatio is probably a Stoic. Because a Stoic believed this is all there is. What you see here and now, that's all there is. No life after death. There's nothing that comes before you are born. And so Hamlet is saying, 
Horatio, you've got to broaden your horizons. You've got to expand your mind. You're going to see more things in this world than your philosophy allows the possibility of existence of. Okay? So that, I mean, literally, expand your mind. Okay? So, he's already gotten them to swear that they're not going to reveal anything that they've seen this evening. Now he says one more thing. Here, as before, never so help you mercy, how strange or odd so e'er I bear myself, as I perchance hereafter shall think meet to put an antic disposition on, that you at such time see me never shall with arms and cumber, blah, blah, blah. What? Don't give out. Don't betray. Don't reveal that you know I'm putting on an act. The antic disposition. Your gloss says for antic, fantastic. I have no idea what the hell that is supposed to mean. Fan a fantastic disposition? No. What do you mean? Crazy. That's what antic means. Don't give out that I'm acting. So what he's telling us is, from here on out, how do we know when Hamlet's acting crazy or if he is crazy? First of all, is Hamlet crazy at this point? Not necessarily. Is it crazy? Is it mad? Is it lunacy to contemplate suicide? Some would say yes. Some would say no. I kind of think if you are seriously weighing the idea of ending yourself, then that indicates, at the very least, some level of mental illness. Why? Because one of the principles of life, especially of ambulatory living things, that is things that can move, is to do what? Flee from death. Flee from things that can kill you. Okay? Life wants to go on, and you're trying to end it. Something's not right. right? So they all agree. They swear. Then Hamlet says, let us go in together and steal your finger on your lips, I pray. The time is out of joint. The time is out of joint. What does he mean? It's not properly connected. Like 10 doesn't go to 11 to 12 to 1. It goes 10 to... He means that great chain of being that I referred to before. That's out of kilter. It's, it's off. Time is out of joint. O cursed spite that ever I was born to set it right. Notice, the time is out of joint now. But when was Hamlet born? Not now. Years ago. Hamlet is suggesting that he was born at a particular time, in a particular place, in a, in a particular location, in order to, at this specific moment in time, to put that great chain back into order. So if that's the case, I'm saying if that's the case, Hamlet is saying there is a reason for my being. There is a reason for my existence. See, that's what someone who is contemplating suicide largely wants to know. I want to know, why am I here? And is it all just crap? Or do I have something to do? Well, Hamlet is saying, I have something to do. That's not kill myself. All right? Shakespeare's alluding, not stating, not referring. He's alluding to the idea of um, God's providence or the... Calvinist slash Protestant notion of predestination. He was predestined to be born at this time to take care of, whenever he was, to take care of the problem at this time. Okay? So, Act 2. We're in Polonius's house, and we have Reynaldo and Polonius. Reynaldo is a servant. He's just called Polonius's man. Okay? And Polonius is giving... Reynaldo orders. Orders to do what? 
He's going to send him to Paris, where his son is studying at the university, Laertes. And he's going to send him to Paris for one purpose. It's, it's the first real instance of this in the play. And what I mean by real is it's the first overt instance of spying. Okay? He's sending Ronaldo to spy on his son. And he's doing that because he wants to make sure his son is following those proverbs that he gave him, those precepts. All right? So, Reynaldo gets his orders, he leaves. Ophelia comes in. And Polonius says, line 73, How now, Ophelia? What's the matter? Why does he say, What's the matter? I mean, if he just walks in the room nonchalantly, no problem with him. Why would he say, what's the matter? There's something about her when she enters the stage. She looks I don't know, disheveled. She looks bothered. Maybe she's flustered. Maybe she's out of breath. And she says, oh, my Lord, my Lord, I've been so frightened. He goes, what's happened? My lord, as I was sewing in my closet, Lord Hamlet, with his doublet all embraced, no hat upon his head, his stockings hung foul, his stockings foul, unguarded, down jiving to his ankle, pale as a shirt, his knees knocking each other. He comes before me. Okay? What she has just described, with the medical diagnosis in the middle, late Middle Ages in Shakespeare's day, and the medical diagnosis was lovesickness. Those are the symptoms of being lovesick. He came in, we're told, his doublet, your gloss tells you a tight coat. It sometimes often had sleeves. Sometimes it was more just like a vest, okay? But it was very tight over the shoulders, around the stomach, and around the back. Lots of buttons, okay? He comes in, we're told, with his doublet all unbuttoned. Not wearing a hat, it was Shakespeare's day, standard practice. Gentlemen in company where women would be wore a hat. Okay. His stockings, which should be pulled up, tied by garters, are ungartered, and they've fallen down to his ankles. So she sees his bare legs. He's suffering lovesickness, and he's forgotten to dress properly because his mind is preoccupied with his love. She says, he comes before me, Polonius, mad for thy love. See, Polonius assumes on the description he, she has just given, Hamlet's lost it. He's crazy. She goes, I don't know. What did he say? He took me by the wrist and held me hard. And then he goes to the length of the, all his arm. So he grabs her by the wrist. So her hand is outstretched like this. And he's holding her wrist. And he goes all the way to the extent of, extent of his arm and her arm fully extended, like this. And then he shades his eyes like there's a glare and looks at her face. In perusal of my face as, he, as if he would draw it. Long steady so. And then he shakes his arm and also her arm a bit and shakes his head three times, waving up and down. He sighs, his whole body shakes, and then he lets her go. So there's the door, he lets her go, his body's facing this way, but he's like this as he walks out. Clearly, what is Hamlet doing? He's putting on an antic disposition. Question is, why? Why does he do this with Ophelia? Where have we seen Ophelia so far in the play? Talking with her brother, talking with her father. Now she's talking with her father again. Have we seen Ophelia and Hamlet together? No, we haven't. We're going to in Act 3. Okay. It's, a, it's an important question why he's doing this with her. Polonius. Come on, come with me. We're going to go see the king. This is the very ecstasy of love. 
Ecstasy means out of body. Literally, according to the Greek, the soul leaves the body. And it was thought in, in Greek belief that the soul could leave the body and the body would still live. The soul would have an out of body experience kind of a thing. Here, it means he's lost his reason, okay? Because of love. Whose violent property foredoes itself and leads the will to desperate undertakings. If someone is crazy for love, mad for love, <coughs> Polonius is suggesting sometimes that kind of person does things to him or herself. They kill themselves for love. Romeo, Juliet, Pyramus, Thisbe in A Midsummer Night's Dream, all kinds of lovers throughout history have killed themselves for not being able to have their love um, requited because the other one dies. Okay, So, he asks her, as they make their way to the king, have you given him hard words of late? She says, no, I just did what you ordered. Letters he sent me, I returned to Cinder, and I didn't let him come in my room and speak to me. That's it. That's made him mad. Crazy, not angry. All right? And then her, uh, Polonius says, I am sorry that with better heed and judgment I had not quoted him. And by quoted him, he means in the previous scene where we saw he and Ophelia, he tells Ophelia what he thinks is going through Hamlet's mind. And that those gifts, those letters, those poems that Hamlet had written for her were all, as he calls them, um, brokers. They were all to buy something, to get something in exchange. Sex is what he implies. Now he's saying, I was wrong. I feared he did but trifle and meant to wreck thee. That is, get you in bed. But beshrew my jealousy by heaven it is as proper to our age to cast beyond ourselves and our opinions as it is common for the younger sort to lack discretion. So why did he think that's what Hamlet intended before? He's going to tell us a little bit later because that's the way he was. In other words, when he was Hamlet's age, he wasn't really thinking of some girl's honor. All he wanted to do was get in her bed. Okay? Scene two. We see the king and queen come in. They come in with Rosencrantz and Guildenstern and others. And the king welcomes these two characters, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. We've not seen them before. But we find out very early on they're childhood friends of Hamlet's. He was raised with them. Okay? And so they say, we've sent for you so that as much as from occasion, line 16, you may glean whether aught to us unknown afflicts him thus, that open lies within our remedy. Because he said to them earlier that something is wrong with Hamlet. There's a transformation. He says, line five. Why? Because neither the interior Hamlet nor the exterior Hamlet seems to be what he was before. And the king wants to know, is this just because of his father's death? It seems to be more than that. All right? So, figure it out, guys. Hang around Hamlet, get him drunk, get him talking. The queen begs them to do this. They agree. They leave. Polonius comes in. With some ambassadors, the king speaks with the ambassadors, Cornelius and Boltemon first, and then sends them on their way. Okay. So, Polonius then speaks. Line 86. My liege and madam, to expostulate what majesty should be, what duty is, why day is day, night, night, and time is time, were nothing but to waste night, day, and time. Therefore, since brevity is the soul of wit, it's taken him six lines to say nothing, essentially, right? He says, I will be brief. Your noble son is mad. Lost his mind. The queen, 95. More matter with less art. More matter 
We're going to hear that phrase repeatedly. Polonius said when the feeling came in, what's the matter? Here, more matter with less art. In a moment, Polonius is going to ask Hamlet, what's the matter? Talking about material Hamlet is reading. More matter, more meat, more substance, get to the point with less art, less rhetoric. Okay, Just give it to me straight. And Polonius says, I'm not using any art. Okay, And he goes on and talks about Ophelia and Hamlet. And he reads a letter that Hamlet wrote to Ophelia. Queen, this is from Hamlet? And he says, of course it is. King, 127 or so. How hath she received his love? How has Ophelia responded, responded to Hamlet's expressions of love? What do you think of me? Polonius asks. Notice, he doesn't just answer the question. Why? More art, less matter. What do you think? Um, you're a man faithful and honorable. I would fain prove so. But what might you think? When I'd seen this hot love on the wing, as I perceived it, before my daughter told me, that is, I had an inkling something was going on, what would you think if I had played the desk or table book or given my heart a winking? That is, if I had not said anything to you, if I kept it to myself, what's his point? What would you think if I encouraged this relationship or looked upon this love with idle sight? What would you think? What's his point? Mentioned it before. Hamlet is what? He's a prince. Ophelia is the daughter of a commoner. She's a commoner. She's not in Hamlet's sphere of influence, so to speak, okay? And he says, I told her immediately, Hamlet is a prince, out of thy star, that is, out of your reach. What would you think if I encouraged her, okay? King, you really think that's it? You think that because she's turned Hamlet away, he's gone mad? Polonius says, uh, have there been such a time I would fain know that that I positively said to so when it proved otherwise has there ever been a time when I told you something is true and I was wrong King says uh, not that I know of then take this from this if otherwise take my head from my body if I'm wrong kill me now that's a bit of foreshadowing. It's not foreshadowing in the sense that Polonius is going to lose his head. It is foreshadowing in the sense that Polonius is going to die because he is wrong. Okay. Is he wrong that Hamlet is mad for love? Yes. Is he wrong that, mad, that Hamlet is in love? No. King, how may we try it Further, what does he mean by the verb try? Prove. It means to try something means to prove it. You have a trial to do what? To prove someone's innocence or guilt. Okay. How how can we prove this? So Polonius comes up with an idea. Again, bear in mind everything Polonius is doing is what. It's totally contrary to the advice he gave his son. <clears throat> so, you know sometimes he walks four hours here in the lobby. So they're in some kind of big room. Queen says, yep, yeah, that's true, he does. Polonius. So, sometime when he's doing that, at such a time, line nine, uh, 161, I'll loose my daughter to him. Be you and I, he's talking to the king, be you and I behind an heiress then. An heiress is a curtain. If you think of the stage being like this, these are doors, okay? They would have, as they have at Shakespeare's Globe today, curtains in front of those. Sometimes 
There are curtains across the entire back wall of that stage. He says, we'll hide behind those and do what? We will mark the encounter. We'll watch, we'll observe, okay? If he love or not, let me be no assistant for a state. Send me off to a farm, all right? So, one of the important words in that little speech is the verb loose. He says, I'll loose my daughter to him. We only use that verb in that meaning, okay, in relation to dogs. I'll loose my dogs means I'm going to set my dogs on you if you trespass the property. If you do something, we'll loose the dogs on the hounds or on the foxes kind of a thing. Comparing his daughter to a dog, all right? What else does it make of Ophelia? So what is Polonius suggesting he and the king do? Mention it in relation to Reynaldo. They spy on Hamlet. And now what does he make Ophelia? Part of the conspiracy. Does she know that they're going to be spying? We're not told that he is going to tell her what they're doing. All right? King, we'll try it. Hamlet comes in reading a book. Okay? So Polonius tells the others to leave and that he will board Hamlet. Board's a naval or maritime term. When you want to take control of another ship, you maneuver your ship up alongside it and you throw a board that reaches the breach from your ship to the other ship. The other end has spikes in it so that when you let it fall, those spikes will land and either stick in the deck railing or in the deck, okay? Run across, take control. It's a violent term. That's why your gloss says to accost. He says, I'll board him presently, meaning I'm going to force Hamlet to give me information. So, he goes up to Hamlet. Do you know me, my lord? Excellent, well, you are a fishmonger. Your gloss tells you, fishmonger means an opprobrious expression meaning bawd, procurer. Nobody uses those words in modern English. That gloss ought to be aimed for college students. What does he mean by a bawd or procurer, a pimp? That's what he means. You sell human flesh, not like slavery, you sell flesh for sex, okay? That's a slang term for fishmonger, or a slang definition for fishmonger in Shakespeare's day. Literally, fishmonger means one who sells fish. A monger is a seller of. You can go to London today, and you can still go to fishmongers. And I'm not talking about the red light district. You can go to ironmongers. We call those places in the United States hardware stores to buy stuff made out of metal and steel and such. So Hamlet calls him a fishmonger. Not I, my lord. Polonius understands it to have the pimp meaning. Then I word you were so honest a man. How is a fishmonger, a pimp, honest? What do you know you're going to get? If you go to a pimp, you know you're going to get a whore. <laughs> That's it. A pimp isn't, you don't pay a pimp 50 bucks and expect him to bring you dinner. It, it's a simple transaction. There's, there's nothing false there. Okay? Honest, my lord? Polonius is trying to wrap his mind around this. I, sir, to be honest, as this one goes, is to be one man picked out of 10,000. In A Midsummer Night's Dream, we saw Puck say that. For every million men, there is one who's faithful, honest, and true. Here, it's one in 10,000. Polonius, that's very true. Notice, if you take both those statements 
one in 10,000 employees agrees. That's a pretty bleak perspective. I mean, if you can only find one in 10,000 who is honest, wow. Hamlet, for if the son breed maggots in a dead dog, being a good kissing carrier, have you a daughter? Okay, so how does Hamlet get from fishmonging, one in 10,000 being true or loyal or honest, to the son, a dead dog, and maggots. What's, what's the logical connection in thought that leads from this to this? There's none, right? It's seemingly random. But it's not in Hamlet's thinking. For if the son breed maggots and a dead dog, being a good kissing carrion, have you a daughter? How does the sun breed maggots in a carcass? By shining on it. By shining on it, okay? The breed maggots. It was thought in the Middle Ages and up through Shakespeare's day that, you know, when there's an animal gets hit by a wagon or something like that and it's on the side of the road, after a few days, maggots are in it. It was thought those maggots are the offspring of the sun impregnating it with its rays, right? So dead dogs lying in the sun breed maggots. Have you a daughter? Why? Okay, first of all, he does know who Polonius is. He does know Ophelia is his daughter. But why does he ask the question, have you a daughter? Polonius, I have my lord. Polonius should respond very slowly and like, what are you talking about? Let her not walk in the sun. Why not? Well, if a dead dog can breed maggots because it's in the sun, what's going to happen to your daughter if she walks in the sun? Hamlet could be alluding to the Renaissance portrayal of women who spent a lot of time in the sun were sexually loose, okay? And that's because one of the terms for a lady of the evening, a lady of the night, is what? Street walkers. And if you walk the street, because hookers in Shakespeare's day didn't only ply their trade at night, they did it during, as happens in the United States, you know? Let her not walk in the sun. Conception is a blessing. Old Testament gives all kinds of stories. Somebody has many children, it's a blessing of God. Okay? Conception is a blessing. We well, just want to see what that can lead to. Quibble on understanding and pregnancy. It could have the meaning of understanding or perception, but I don't think that's what Shakespeare is talking about at all, or what Hamlet is. Conception is a blessing, but as your daughter may conceive, friend, look to it. You don't want your daughter breeding maggots, do you? That's an idea that Hamlet, both the character and the play, are going to bring up a lot later on. Hamlet's essentially going to say, we're all nothing but maggots, crawling on the earth, and then we die, and what happens? We give rise to more maggots. Okay? Hamlet's one of the bleakest plays by Shakespeare. Uh, Macbeth is really the bleakest, I think. So, Polonius has his first aside. There's going to be three asides in this little scene. And so when he, when he says these words... Bear in mind, in an aside, nobody else on the stage hears this. Only the audience here hears. Okay? It's similar to a soliloquy, but in a soliloquy, the actor is alone on stage, and the actor is, the character, is revealing his or her innermost thoughts. The aside doesn't necessarily reveal the character's innermost thoughts. Okay? So, 
Polonius. How saved by that? That is, what do you think that means? Still harping on my daughter. Still? He said two words about his daughter. I wouldn't call that harping. Where else has Hamlet talked to anybody else about Ophelia? He hasn't. If anything, you could say, who's, do, who's doing the harping? It's Polonius. Said it was a fishmonger. Far gone. Far gone. And yet, truly, in, excuse me, and truly in my youth, I suffered much extremity for love. Very near this. Polonius just revealed something. The reason he made those assumptions about Hamlet when Ophelia first told him about their relationship because that's how he was when he was a young man. I'll speak to him again. Uh, what, do, what do you read, my lord? Words, words, words. Notice Hamlet being a smart ass. Uh, what is the matter? The word matter has two meanings. The matter of his reading, what is the stuff he is reading, but it also means like you would say to me or I would say to you if you came in, and you just, you know, like you came in with tears on you. I said, what's the matter? That implies what is wrong. Hamlet takes it to mean the second meaning. Between who? What is the matter? What is the problem? Between. Between means by two. Between two people. I, I mean the matter that you read, my lord. Why does Hamlet say between who? Do you think Hamlet understands what he's asking? What's the matter of the words that he's reading? Of course he does. Hamlet wants to delve a little deeper, though. Why? First line of the poem, of the play, who's there? He's asking a question about identity. Here, Hamlet asks, between who? The first one, who's there, is kind of like a singular, who, who is out there. Here. There are two who's. Who is the matter between? Who are the protagonist and antagonist? Hamlet, Claudius. Does Hamlet know he's being watched? We don't know. Oh, I mean the matter that you read, my lord. Slanders, and so Hamlet talks about supposedly what he's reading which doesn't make sense, and yet it kind of does. So Polony says another aside. Though this be madness, yet there is method to it, or method in it. In other words, it doesn't make any sense, and yet there is a sense to it. Read, we're going to read a poem by um, Charles Lutwidge Dodgson, also called Lewis Carroll towards the last of the semester, called The Jabberwocking. It's a nonsense poem. It doesn't make any sense. And yet, within the stanzas of the poem, you can pick out some sense. He invents words. So you have nouns, verbs, subjects, adjectives, adverbs. It's just you don't know what most of those words literally mean. But it makes perfect grammatical sense. That's kind of what Polonius is talking about here. Okay. Will you walk out of the air, my lord? That is, will you leave from inside this room and go outside on the balcony? Into my grave. Well, so you have ground and you step into the grave. You're out of the air, covered by earth. Polonius, <laughs> indeed, that's out of the air. How pregnant aside. So everything now is inside. How pregnant sometimes his replies are. A happiness that often madness hits on, which reason and sanity could not so prosperously be delivered of. That is, sometimes crazy people say things that they don't realize the truth of what they're saying. 
So he says, I'm going to leave and find the means to loose my daughter on him. My honorable Lord, I will most humbly take my leave of you. It's a proper expression for kind of a commoner to say before leaving the presence of one of high rank. And he probably bows and does this kind of thing. I must take my leave of you. Hamlet replies, you cannot, sir, take from me anything that I will more willingly part with all. You can't take your leave from me. Why? Because I willingly want you to leave. Get the hell out of here. But he's not finished. Except my life, except my life, except my life. Meaning, you can take that. which he more willingly parts with? What did Hamlet's first soliloquy talk about? Oh, that this too, too sullied flesh would thaw and melt, resolve itself into a beard, or that the everlasting had not fixed his cannon against self-slaughter. I wish I would just die. Can't, I'm not going to just die. I wish I could kill myself, but I can't, because God forbids it. Hamlet here is kind of suggesting, but you could kill me. He would willingly part with his life. He also willingly would part from Polonius. Okay? Rosencrantz and Guildenstern come in, Polonius leaves. Hamlet, good lads, how do ye both? as the indifferent children of the earth. Your gloss tells you for indifferent, it means ordinary. That's one meaning. It also means um, content. They're not super happy and they're not depressed. We're just, you know, whatever. We're just floating on along with life. Gildenstern, happy in that we are not over happy. On fortune's cap, we are not the very button. We've talked about fortune before. Fortune, the goddess fortune, was portrayed both as a goddess, or the, the thing fortune, was portrayed both as a goddess and as a wheel that she spun. Okay? So the wheel of fortune is always moving. You want to be on the upward spiral part of it, or the upward turn. So they say... We're not on the very button of her cap. So if you think of uh, Fortune as a goddess and she's wearing a hat, they're not sitting there at the very top of Fortune. They're happy that they're not there. Why? Because the wheel keeps turning. And if you're up there at the very top, you're about to suffer sorrow and heartache and pain and loss. Okay? Hamlet, nor the soles of your shoes. You're also not at the very bottom of Fortune. So think of the wheel. Here's the button, here's the soles of the shoe. Neither, my lord. Hamlet. Then you live about her waist or in the middle of her favors. So the wheel would be here, but if you're talking the stick figure woman, faith, her privates we. That is, you're right, Hamlet. We live about her privates, her genitalia. In the secret parts of fortune, oh, most true, she is a strumpet. Fortune's a slut. How so? Fortune sleeps with everything. Everything undergoes, to use language that Hamlet's going to use in Act 3, the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. This bottle, made out of plastic, will eventually millions of years, degrade. This sweater in 40 or 50 years will degrade. This body will be gone in 20 or 30 years. This building, God be praised, will be gone at some point, maybe in the next 20 or 30 years. It's one of those ugly buildings on campus. That's what he means. Fortune sleeps with everything. What's the news? None. But the world's grown honest. Hamlet, then it must be near doomsday. 
Why? Because the world hasn't grown on us, Hamlet's point is. He says, but that's not true. Tell me, why are you here? Why did fortune send you to prison hither, to this place? Gilden says, prison? Hamlet, Denmark's a prison. Then is the world one. A goodly one, in which there are many confines, wards, and dungeons, Denmark being one of the worst. Okay, so they play along with Hamlet. Hamlet says Denmark's a prison. Well, then the world must be a prison. You're right, it is. Denmark's one of the lowest dungeons. We think not so, my lord. We don't think Denmark's a prison. We don't think the world's a prison. What did Hamlet say in that first soliloquy? How weary and profitable, stale and flat is this world? Okay. Hamlet. So, we think not so, my lord. We don't think Denmark's a prison. Why then, tis none to you. For there is nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. To me, it is a prison. What's Hamlet's point? Nothing is either good or bad. He's not talking about physical reality. Hamlet's not saying, I, by thinking, can make this something other than what it is. Okay? He's saying, nothing is either good or bad except we think it is. What might be good for you might be bad for me. That is, you might think something is good that I think is bad, and vice versa. For you to do that thing is okay. For me, it's not okay. He's possibly, Shakespeare, possibly alluding to Paul in one of his letters talks about eating. He's talking about the difference between those who eat only vegetables and those who eat meat and vegetables. And he says to the person who only eats vegetables, eating meat is evil. And he says to the other person, it's not evil to eat meat or vegetables. But he says, the person who eats both shouldn't judge the one who eats only vegetables. Why? Because for that person's frame, mental perspective, to eat something other than vegetables, it's wrong for them. And because it's wrong for them, if they eat meat, they've sinned, so to speak. All right? Notice, their thinking makes it wrong. That's why he also goes on, the same passage, says, if you're eating, and you know the food you're eating has been offered to idols. That is, you know it has been offered to idols. Don't eat it. Why? Because you know, as a quote unquote, within the context of the New Testament, we, as a Christian, you shouldn't eat anything offered to idols. If you don't know that, however, Paul says, there's no problem. You're not guilty of sinning if you don't know. Okay, so, to me, Hamlet says, it's a prison. Why, then your ambition makes it one. Tis too narrow for your mind. What does Rosencrantz mean by Hamlet's ambition? Well, he's the prince. What more could he look forward to? What else could he want? Being king. Okay? Talked before about primogeniture and stuff. He should be the king. Just as the ghost usurps the time of night and the form of the dead king, Claudius usurped Hamlet's throne. Because Hamlet should be the king now. So, your ambition makes it one. Your ambition makes Denmark too small. Is too narrow for your mind. Denmark, if we had a map up here, Denmark is a little small strip of land that sticks off the northern part of Germany. Compared to Germany, Norway, Sweden, it's tiny. He's saying, you want to be more than king of just Denmark. You want it all. 
Hamlet. Oh, God. I could be bounded in a nutshell and count myself a king of infinite space. Were it not that I have bad dreams. Mid-20th century, an American astronomer slash cosmologist postulated, named Edwin Hubble, postulated what's called the Hubble Constant. The Hubble Constant is a speed, and it is the speed at which the universe is expanding. It's the speed at which all the stars, galaxies, are moving away from each other. It's because of the Hubble constant that the idea of the Big Bang arose. Everything is expanding outward. In other words, there had to shrink all that at some point, have been a singularity that exploded. Why do I bring this up? What's the universe expanding into? What's outside? Nothing? N nothing doesn't exist. Nothing is non-existent. It's the absence of existence. So what is it? For it to be expanding, there's got, there's got to be something for it to be expanding into. It can't be nothing. See, it's a, there's a logical issue there. Why do I bring this up? Look at what Hamlet says. I could be bounded in a nutshell like one of those black walnuts down in the walnut grove and count myself a king of infinite space. So here's the nutshell. Hamlet's in there and he thinks the space between those walls is infinite. Were it not that I have bad dreams, what's the point about the dream? Where do the dreams come from? Hamlet is suggesting they come from outside. That's why I brought up the Hubble constant, what's outside the universe. He says, Denmark isn't too small. I could be a king of infinite space, but I have these bad dreams. Where do the dreams come from? If the space is infinite, I shouldn't have bad dreams. The dreams are coming in from the outside. Okay? Gildenstern, he's going to take a crack. Which dreams indeed are ambition? That is, your dreams are your ambition, Hamlet. <clears throat> For the very substance of the ambitious, that is the thing one is ambitious for, the kingship, let's say, is what? It's the shadow of a dream. Okay, how can a dream have shadows? We've talked about this with, you know, the allegory of the cave. I hold this up to here. You can kind of see the shadows. You have to have something solid to cause, create a shadow. For the very substance of the ambitious is merely the shadow of a dream. Hamlet, a dream is itself but a shadow. What is Hamlet's point? It's different than Gildenstern's. So if a dream is a shadow, then what does that mean? There's something else out there that has caused the dream in the mind. Because the dream is a shadow of something else. So there must be more something else out there. It echoes back to, Har to Hamlet telling Horatio there is more in heaven and earth than is dreamt of in your philosophy, Horatio. He's also saying there that, Horatio, your philosophy is dreams. But there's a reality. There's something more there. Okay? Rosencrantz. Truly, that is your right, Hamlet. And I hold ambition of so airy and light a quality that it is but a shadow's shadow. What is... Rosencrantz getting at? Why be ambitious? You're never going to achieve what that lofty goal is. Why chase the shadow? Hamlet. Okay, so if you're right, then are our beggars bodies? What's he getting at? He's getting at Plato's 
allegory of the gay. So you have the light up here. He says our fingers are bodies. So the light hits those bodies and we get the shadow. And the shadow is what? And our monarchs and outstretched heroes, the beggars' shadows. His point? Monarchs, heroes, and outstretched is like the hero dying, defending, protecting, etc. These are essentially mirror images. Hamlet's going to use this later on. In both Act Three, Act Four, and uh, Act Three, Act Four, and Act Five, because he's talking here about the nature of humanity in what life is about. What is the reason for existence? Shall we to the court? For by my faith, I cannot reason. By my faith, by my faith, I can't argue. And his point is that I, I've reached the highest I can go. He might mean that literally, or he might mean it facetiously. Question is, in this little speech, or in this scene between Hamlet and Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, is Hamlet being serious, semi-serious, or is he just playing? Is this more of his antic disposition? Oh, I can reason, I can argue logically and such with you guys, and let's take it to the nth degree. So, they tell Hamlet, that should be. Hamlet asked again, why are you here? Well, to visit you. Hamlet quit lying. 265. I know the good king and queen have sent for you. To what end? That is, why? To what purpose? Hamlet, you have to tell me that. Okay? Were you sent for or no? What do you think? So Hamlet then, 276, does tell them why they were sent for. He says, I don't know why, but I've been out of sorts of late. He says, I have of late, 277, lost all my mirth, forgone all custom of exercises, and it seems to me that the earth, the sterile promontory, the most excellent canopy, the air, etc., it is all nothing but a foul and pestilent congregation of vapor. Life sucks. And then he goes on and expounds upon man. What a piece of work is a man. How noble and reason, blah, blah, blah. But to me, what is man but the quintessence of dust? That's it, man. We're just dirt. Okay? Okay. And there's a little pun on whether or not Hamlet's gay or not, and he's not. And they say, well, you know, if you don't take any pleasure in man, then you're not going to like the players, the actors that are coming in. So the actors come in with Polonius. We're going to skip a bunch. And Hamlet asks the first actor to do part of a speech he's heard before. And the speech is about Hector and Priam and Hecuba. Okay? And the actor does this scene, and he's just got tears running down his face. And just before the actors leave, Hamlet asks the first actor, first player, if I were to give you some lines tomorrow, 12 to 16 lines, could you do those? Could you put those in the play? He goes, sure, not a problem. <clears throat> they all leave. Hamlet gets a soliloquy, a long one beginning around line 498 or so. Now I am alone. Oh, what a rogue and peasant slave am I. Why? Because he talks about, in the soliloquy, <clears throat> what the player was able to do in acting about Hecuba and Priam and such, and to portray this sorrow, this loss, that the character experienced, not the actor. And he says, what's Hecuba to him, or he to Hecuba, that he should weep for her? His point is, 
I should be weeping like this. What would he do had he the motive and the cue for passion that I have? Here's, how, here's why he's a rogue and peasant slave. Why am I not able to do that, to show that kind of sorrow? He says, line 521, am I a coward? Who calls me though and breaks my pate, that is my head, the cross, plucks off my beard? Who does these things to me? It cannot be but that line to 527, but that I am pigeon livered, we would say lily livered, yellow bellied, and lack gall to make oppression bitter. I must be a coward. Because if I weren't, what would I have done? I should have fatted all the region kites with this slave's offal. The slave? He's talking about Claudius. I'd have gutted him, spilled his guts, to let the birds eat. This is most brave, 534, that I, the son of a dear father murdered, prompted to revenge by heaven and hell, is he prompted by heaven? Must, like a whore, unpack my heart with words and fall a-cursing like a very drab. So he tells us, I've heard it said that someone is guilty of something when the thing he has done is portrayed before him, the person's guilt will make itself known. The person will do something. To reveal it. So he says, I'll have these players, 546, play something like the murder of my father before mine uncle. I'll observe his looks. If it do blench, I know my course. If he blanches, if he goes all white, I know what I have to do. Why? Why is he going to do this? The spirit that I have seen may be the devil. Even though he said at the top of the page, he's prompted to his revenge by heaven and hell. And the devil hath power to assume a pleasing shape, yea, and perhaps out of my weakness and my melancholy, as he is very potent with such spirits, abuses me to damn me. I'll have grounds more relative than this, meaning I'll have grounds for revenge more relative than just what? The words of a illusion, the words of a, excuse me, hallucination, the words of this ghost, he's saying, I'll have proof. The place, the thing wherein I'll catch the conscience of a king, okay? Act three. So Rosencrantz and Guildenstern come in with the king, queen, Polonius, Ophelia, and such, and they tell the king, we can't figure it out. We don't know what's wrong with them, okay? So they leave. The king tells Gertrude to leave, line 29, and says, for we have closely sent for Hamlet hither, that he is toward by accident may hear affront Ophelia. Confront. Her father and myself, lawful espials. That is, lawfully spying on this uh, exchange between them, that we may of their encounter frankly judge and gather by him as he is beheaded, if it be the affliction of his lover, no. Okay. Queen says, I obey you. I'll get ready to leave. And then she says to, Polo uh, to Ophelia, so shall I hope your virtues will bring him to his wonted way again to both your honors. So Ophelia is now part of this. Ophelia has heard what the king just said. We're using you to spy on Hamlet. The queen is admitted, she knows what's going on, and she tells Ophelia, hopefully what you are about to do will bring honor to you and to Hamlet. Now, I could be entirely wrong, but I think she's suggesting, implying, that Ophelia, you play your cards right, you might end up Hamlet's wife, okay? So, Polonius tells Ophelia what to do. Walk you here, read on this book, that show of such an exercise may color your loneliness. And we're told, 
It's a prayer book. How do we know? Because she's supposed to be walking with devotion visage. That is, in rapt attention to God, reading these prayers. All right? And we know the prayers because Hamlet is going to tell her to remember him in her orisons, in her prayers. In just a moment. So look what Polonius says, because it prompts an aside by the king. We are oft to blame in this. Tis too much proved that with devotion's visage and pious action, we do sugar over the devil himself. With devotion's visage, with a face of pious faith to God, and pious action, holy action, pretending to be holy, pretending to help the poor. It might literally be helping the poor, but not for the right intention. Okay? There might be some nefarious subterfuge going on. And that's why the king says, an aside. Oh, it is true. How smart a lash that speech doth give my conscience. What does he mean? The king knows what he's done and is doing is wrong. In other words, he thinks it's evil. It is evil. So Hamlet comes in. Exempt the king and Polonius. Where do they withdraw to? Okay. Notice who has not exited the stage. Hamlet comes out, let's say here, Ophelia is still on the stage. If Ophelia is still on the stage, it cannot be a soliloquy. Even the textbook I use for my Shakespeare course, one of the greatest Shakespeare scholars in the world, refers to this speech as a soliloquy. It is not a soliloquy. And because it's not a soliloquy, because Hamlet is not the only person on the stage, it cannot be read as Hamlet's true inner beliefs. It might all be an act. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether tis nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against the sea of troubles, and by opposing in them, to die, to sleep, no more. And by a sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to, tis a consummation devoutly to be wished die, to sleep, to sleep, perchance to dream, aye, there's the rub, for in that sleep of death what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause, and there's the respect that makes calamity of so long life. Now, sounds like he's totally contemplating suicide, right? He's de- contemplating death and what death leads to. What does he say death leads to? Sleep? What happens when we sleep? We dream. If sleep is an image of death and we dream during sleep, Hamlet is saying, what might be beyond the door? Dreams may come. So he says, there's the respect that makes calamity of so long a life. That is, it's the respect of what's coming next that makes one willing to go on living. And it makes a long life into a calamity. How so? The longer you live, the more you what? Experience. 
Someone who dies at 20 does not experience nearly what I've experienced at 62. Or what my dad experienced at 84, 86, whatever it was, when he died. I know people, some of my relatives, some of my siblings, they want to live into their 90s. I'm like, hell no. I mean, it's bad enough falling apart at 62. I can't imagine 92. Or it's bad enough seeing the people die already that I know. Just imagine how many more there will be. That's Hamlet's point. For who would bear the whips and scorns of time? The oppressor is wrong. So the whips and scorns are produced by multiple things. Time, the oppressor, the proud man's contumely, that is his, his looking down at you, the pangs of despised love, hitting a little close to home possibly, the laws delay, because justice denied is justice delayed. That's why the Constitution grants us a right to a speedy trial. The insolence of office, that's again looking down their noses, and the spurns that patient merit of the unworthy takes when he himself could do what? Take out his dagger and... Who would fardels, that's burdens, Bear to grunt and sweat unto a weary life, but that the dread of something after death, the undiscovered country from whose bourne no traveler returns. It does what? It puzzles the will. The will is what? The will is that faculty of us that says, go, do, act. It's the volition. These things do what? They puzzle. They stop it in its tracks. And they say, yeah, but what about? And makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others that we know not of. What's the phrase that we use today? Better the devil you know than the one you don't know. Thus conscience does make cowards of us all. Conscience. Thinking about ramifications, consequences. And thus the native hue of resolution is sicklied over with the pale cast of thought. What does that mean, the native hue of resolution? Do you ever have your car break down and you've got to push it and get it off the road? I've had that happen a few times in my life. I was the only one in the car. And I had to get it off the road onto the shoulder. I wasn't able to get it onto the shoulder for whatever reason. So I went there pushing on the steering wheel in the part of the window, getting it. What happens to your face when you really are doing something that is exerting a lot of strength? Tenses up, you turn red. Why? All that blood flows. That is the native hue of resolution. And what happens to it? It gets sicklied over with the pale cast of thought. That is, you start to weigh the good and bad, the pros and cons. And that hue, that redness, that determination, just drains away. And enterprises of great pitch and moment. Pitch means degree, like shooting for the moon. What happens to those? With this regard, their currents turn awry and lose the name of action. Soft you now, the ferrophilia. Has Hamlet been saying these words in his mind? No, he's been saying these out loud. Nymph in thy orisons be all my sins remembered. Is he yelling to her to get her attention? Or has she heard all this? She's on the stage. We don't see in Ophelia enters. So we, we have a conversation between them. Good, my lord, how does your honor for this many a day? Well, what can that serve as a reminder of? What does she mean? Haven't seen you for a while, Hamlet. How you doing? Why hasn't she seen him for a while? 
because she's kept her damn door closed. She hasn't paid any attention to him. She's ignored him. I, I'm fine. And then she goes, oh, I have some things that belong to you. Let me return them. Hamlet, no, not me. Never gave you out. You know you did. Um, are you honest? You've got a gloss for honest, meaning truthful and chaste. Okay. My lord, are you fair? Your gloss, meaning just or honorable. What do you mean? That if you're honest and fair, your honesty should admit no discourse to your beauty. And the gloss explains that. And she's like, what, couldn't beauty have better commerce than with honesty? That is, shouldn't one who is both beautiful, true, and fair have be also honest and truthful? He says, yeah. For the power of beauty, line 110, will sooner transform honesty from what it is to a bawd, that's a pimp, okay, the female pimp, madam, then the force of honesty can translate beauty unto his likeness. He says, this used to be a paradox, but now it's true. I did love you once. Did once. Double negative, or double past tense. You made me believe so. Oh, Hamlet, I had it so bad for you. Hamlet, you shouldn't have believed me. Why? For virtue cannot so inoculate our old stock, but we shall relish of it. The gloss, our old stock, our old Adam, our old unfallen, sinful human nature. He says what? Virtue cannot so inoculate, it can't so change that. Hamlet is saying we cannot become morally better just by trying to become morally better. We're still stained. We're still rotted. rotted. We're still tainted. To use the language that the ghosts use, taint not your mind. And then he finishes it. I loved you not. I was the more deceived. Why? Because she believed he did. Question. Did Hamlet love her or did he not? Here he's now said three times, I didn't love you. When we get to the end of the play, I'm going to ask again, did Hamlet love her or didn't he? So, he says, long speech, get thee to a nunnery. Why? Why wouldst thou be a breeder of sinners? That's the old stock. Catholic doctrine is that sin what's called original sin it's passed on through sex from Adam and Eve to us today. Period. Everybody is tainted by it. Okay? This notion is understood in different ways according to which branch of Christianity one is part of. According to, mm, don't have time to get into that. We'll stop. I have to pick up um, that on Thursday. Uh, so we're going to come back to the get thee to a nunnery speech on Thursday. All right. Have a good day. Uh, the quiz is open like in an hour um, over at.